Hi, everyone. Welcome back to They Don't Tell You, Pregnancy Edition. Today, I am joined by Dr. Caitlin Bump. Um, and aside from being my very best friend in the entire world, uh, she is a OBGYN. So graduated with a Bachelor of Arts from Georgetown University in psychology with a minor in biology and studio art, just to keep things interesting. Um, Master's of Science, also from Georgetown in complementary and alternative medicine. And then she stuck around for four more years and did her um, MD at Georgetown as well. A lot of time in DC. I knew um, if I stayed for residency that I'd never leave. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she moved up to New York and did her OBGYN residency at Mount Sinai West in New York City. Um, and then she went and practiced for five and a half years doing community health um, in Western Pennsylvania. And now you are um, out in Oregon. Yeah, I'm in Portland. I'm at OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University. Yeah, I moved here last year. Yeah. Oh, and I, I forgot one more credential on your list. You're a licensed <laughs> physician acupuncturist. Sorry about that. That's okay. A lot of education. We're kind of uh, education junkies, right? That's right. I know how to take tests. <laughs> <laughs> take tests really well. Very well. Um, so, you know, the whole point of this series is really just giving women a platform to have a better understanding of what the heck is going on with their bodies um, and questions they don't even know that they're supposed to be asking, right? Um, and I one thing that comes up a lot on, you know, the mommy forums that, you know, we become part of as moms for some reason, um, is the birth process itself. And that's why I wanted to bring you on and really tap into your expertise with this, because a lot of times women feel like they, um, they don't know what to expect and things happen during the birth process that they didn't even know was a possibility. And you know better than, you know, anyone, the number of births that you've attended uh, <laughs> over the years, it's, it can be a very fast paced and kind of little scary process, right? Um, doesn't have to be, but it, but it can be. Um, and a lot of times women kind of end up feeling lost in that process. Um, and so I really wanted to bring you on and give you opportunity to like, give women a heads up of like, you know, most common interventions that happen during a birth why they happen um, and kind of how a doctor is going to talk to you about that because um, sometimes patients don't feel that they've been talked to correctly mm -hmm. um, so and there's a, a variety of things that happen happen there um, but if you want to go ahead and kind of jump in I'm going to let you decide where we go from here choose your own adventure yeah there's a lot and it's yeah. definitely true that you know I, I tell my patients it's like you you don't know what you're getting yourself into you're pregnant and you just don't know and you know we've kind of lost that support community of women and attending births which is unfortunate because you do feel kind of alone in the process which gets you to googling and going on youtube and videoing and it's true that the process can be at times very very fast and at other times incredibly slow so it's not like the movies where you break your water and all of a sudden you're pushing a baby out. Uh, that can happen once in a while, but it is not the norm. Um, oftentimes, and most people know this, but the biggest question is, will I poop in labor? Um, or when pushing, when you deliver a baby. So just to put that out there, most likely you will. It is how you push a baby out is the same way you push stool out. So, and that means you're doing it correctly. Most of the time at that point, you are, you don't care about anything about getting a baby out. So don't worry about it. We're used to it. It's not a big deal. Okay, Just, the doctors and nurses don't care. Like, no, <laughs> we don't care. We see it most of the time. The patient doesn't care. Most of the time, they're actually more worried about their partner seeing it. So uh, don't worry about it. Just going to put that out there, <laughs> that it's not a big deal at all. And, you know, we don't know what actually causes labor, what triggers it. And so your due date's based on 40 weeks. Some places let you go one week past your due date. Some people let you go two weeks past your due date to 42 weeks, whether um, before we do something called an induction. So we induce labor. Um, a lot of places now are following the ARRIVE trial as well, which is 39 weeks and after you can be induced if you want to. And it depends on um, you know, historically it kind of depended on what your cervical dilation was. And we'll talk about that in a second, but I just want to kind of give an over overview of the two things that really cause or de uh, determine how labor goes. One is baby's heart rate. 
baby's heart rate is the best indication for us on how baby is doing. And so we want to see beat to beat variability. We look at the baseline of it, you know, kind of the average fetal heart rate and normal fetal heart rate is between 110 and 160. Most people don't have any idea that, you know, normal adult heart rates, you know, 60 to 80. And we're like, oh, 110, that sounds really fast. You know, and that's actually not very fast for, for a, a fetus. So great. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We want it. We want it higher. Um, between 110 and 160 is normal. And we want it to jump up and down. We want that variability to be good. And there are things called accelerations that kind of tell us that baby's doing well, where the, the heart rate jumps up 15 beats above its baseline and lasts for 15 seconds. And then the other thing is that kind of determines it is, is the deceleration. So if the baby's heart rate goes down, that's kind of what we oftentimes find concerning. There are different types of decelerations and what causes them is different, whether it's um, contraction, you know, the contractions are squeezing the baby's head. And that's generally a good sign that you are actually going to be delivered, hopefully delivering hope soon. Um, there are variable decelerations where they drop real quickly and then come up real quickly like a V. And that is uh, due to cord compression, the umbilical cord gets compressed. And then there are something called late decelerations where the heart rate drops just after a contraction. Those are generally the most concerning because they mean that something's going on with the placenta, that the placenta isn't giving enough blood flow to the baby. Um, and this is over time, you know, one isn't concerning, it's the repetitive nature of it. And then there's something called a prolonged deceleration where the baby's heart rate goes down and stays down. And those are the most concerning. That's when things speed up where everybody, you know, we're shifting you from, so what can happen is a lot of its position. If you're laying on your back, we shift you to the left or right side. Or if the baby's heart rate's down, sometimes even with an epidural, we get you, flip you over. We don't flip you over. We help you flip yourself over and get on your hands and knees. And that can take the pressure off the placenta sometimes too. Um, and I've been in that, all of those positions, by the way. <laughs> My boy and, decided to uh, get real feisty during delivery. So uh it's, it's an interesting process when the nurses are, you know, I did have an epidural and the nurses were ha helping me reposition to, to address the baby's heart rate. And, you know, they, and there's lots of very, cords. you're attached, you got to yeah. move around and those, <laughs> gotta, you know, but we are used to that. And it's true. You're not used to it as the patient, um, but we help you. And it, it is hard to explain exactly what's going on in that. Cause we're, we're looking at the baby's heart rate and we're saying, do this, do that, do that. And usually, at least in what I do is once it's resolved or got, has gotten better, then I do a little debrief. We're like, okay, I know that was scary, but these are all the things that we just did. And this is the reason why. So sometimes it's hard in the moment because of the urgency of the, the, the need for it. Then, then we, we explain afterwards. Yeah. So, um, so those are, and then, so that's the baby's heart rate aspect of what determines labor. The second part of it is your cervix and its dilation and how quickly it dilates and whether it dilates at all. Oh, and yeah. so, right. So, so the, we have some tricks, you know, tricks to help the baby's heart rate. And we have some things that we can do to help your cervix dilate. And, um, you know, most people have heard of Pitocin, the medication that causes contractions. Uh, if you're undergoing, there's two two kind of things, again, kind of break down. There's an induction of labor where you're not contracting at all and we need to get you into labor. And that has some medications that it uses and, and, and mechanical dilation, which we can talk about too. And then there's what's called, called augmentation of laborers. You're already contracting, but the contractions just aren't strong enough or you're not progressing quite, you know, fast enough. Um, in labor and it's not like always about speed, but there is a bit of a timeline to it because of the risk of infection um, and, and what we expect for kind of a normal labor. Um, and that's where Pitocin comes in. So that helps increase the strength of contractions and the frequency of contractions. Um, and so for an induction of labor, there are things called cervical ripening agents and they're medications that help your cervix kind of soften and get ready for those contractions. Um, the two of those are called that we most commonly use is Cytotec, which is mesoprostol. And the other one is Cervidil, which is dinoprostone. And they um, are medications. The, the mesoprostol can be either taken in your mouth, kind of between buccally between your teeth and your cheek, 
or it can be placed vaginally. Uh, the dinoprostone or the cervidale is on a little string that can place, be placed in the vagina and that stays in up to 12 hours. Um, the other thing that can be done, which is I think what you had, is yeah. the Foley balloon. Yeah. <laughs> so, there is a, you know, the a Foley is a, is a catheter that we generally put in the bladder to help drain urine. But if your cervix is a little bit dilated, we can thread it through the vagina or through into the vagina through the cervix, and it sits right on the internal um, cervical os, the opening. And what it does is can and and the pressure with oftentimes. Um, any of those medications I just talked about or the Pitocin is, because baby's head isn't always right against the cervix to get it dilated. So what this Foley balloon does, and we put saline in it, so 30 or 60 cc's of saline, and it just helps the cervix kind of give pressure to that cervix to dilate to about three to four centimeters, it falls out and you're at a good three to four centimeters. Um, and from there, then you can go with Pitocin, we can break your water, which is called artificial rupture of membranes, which is really the best trick to getting you into labor. So, um, so that's what can happen with an induction. And then we start with Pitocin. And Pitocin um, is actually incredibly similar to your body's natural oxytocin in terms of, yes, it's synthetic, but it is almost the exact same thing. And it also has a really quick or short half-life. And so people think once you're on Pitocin, like you're, it, it, it clears it out of your body within six to nine minutes. So um, it's not, it's a really great tool to kind of keep you going and help your cervix dilate to avoid a C-section. So um, yeah, we can, uh, we have, those as options. Are there any indications where um, those um, cervical ripening agents are not indicated? Yes. So we can't give them if you've had a prior C-section. So with a uterine scar, we cannot give the cytotec, which is mesoprostol, or the cervidil, which is dinoprostone. And that's because once they're in your system, and that's the point about the Pitocin being able to turn it off. Once the those medications are in your system, we cannot get them out. It just takes time. And so sometimes they can cause contractions what are called uh, that are back to back to back, tachycystole, where you're having a contraction every one to two minutes, which is sometimes too, too much. And then baby can get distressed. And also um, there's a higher risk of, well, it's not, you know, we think there's a higher risk of uterine rupture, which is that scar um, that's been done, um, you know, on the uterus previously has a risk of breaking open. So yeah, we can't do those. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it yeah. is. It is. We're, we're a little bit limited by that. Yeah. So one of the things that my OB talked to me about, you know, uh, both my boys were born on their due dates, like a couple of weirdos. So I just, it's like, five percent. Happened, right? we're in the 5% category that that happened. <laughs> um, you know, he would have really preferred, especially with my second pregnancy to induce labor at, you know, 39 weeks. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but studies have shown that delivery at that time really reduces the, um, the risk of a secondary C-section. Um, because the baby's smaller, usually has a hard or easier time. Um, but because we were right in the middle of the pandemic, they weren't really scheduling inductions. I didn't meet any criteria for a necessary, uh, medically necessary induction at 39 weeks. So we, we waited until I went into natural labor. But do, is that something that you consider or that you do or... Yeah, so usually if you have a prior C-section, you don't go past your due date, at least that's our practice. And, and it, you know, there are some practice variations and you kind of decide as a group what you as a group is comfortable with doing. So generally what we do is um, schedule a C-section or repeat C-section on your due date. But yes, if you can come in at 39 weeks, and, and it kind of depends on your cervix again. So in medicine, a lot, we just say it depends. depends. <laughs> um, if, if you're able to come in, so my favorite kind of trick for somebody who's had a C-section who wants a trial of labor after a cesarean is if you can get um, uh, through the cervix a little bit, that Foley bulb with a little bit of Pitocin and then two or just break in your water. Those two things are really great ways to get you get things going to give you the best shot at labor. And it's true that, you know, at 39 weeks, baby's a little bit smaller, um, but anywhere between that 39 and 40 weeks, yeah, we, we'd like to get you in and get you 
get you that vaginal delivery that you want. Trust me, by by 39, 40 weeks, we are <laughs> done. You're ready. ready to have a baby out too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> done being incubator mode, right? So. Exactly. Um, so the next thing I know that you and I kind of chatted yesterday about, you know, what we were going to talk about today, but um, one of the things that is becoming less common in practice, but still happens, um, are episiotomies. So talk mm -hmm. us through why someone would need that. Um, are there ways to prevent it? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I would say overall episiotomies are kind of are out of favor. Most physicians are not doing them anymore. And there's a bit of a generational difference in that, we'll say. Um, so episiotomies are effective and very helpful and needed in two scenarios. So um, first is you're crowning. So baby's head is just about to come out, but baby's heart rate is down and you, you just need, need a little extra oomph to get baby out and they're not coming out. Um, some people crown for a long time. And as long as baby's heart rate is totally fine, that's okay. But if baby's heart rate's down and the baby's right there, but needs a little extra help, mm -hmm. um, doing an episiotomy helps give a little bit more space. The whole point is to give more space to help baby get out. Um, and so that's the first indication where instead of, you don't need an assisted delivery, like a vacuum or forceps, but you have to, it's time to deliver. Um, that's the first indication. The second reason to do it is if there's a shoulder dystocia, which is every OBGYN's nightmare, um, is the baby's head comes out, but the shoulder that is kind of by the top of the abdomen, the anterior um, shoulder gets stuck on the pubic bone. And so the baby's not coming out and that can cause, um, major problems because it, it, it prevents uh, the baby's not getting enough blood. And so we have to move quickly. And if, and one of the reason, one of the things that we do is we actually put our hand up into the vagina and we can move baby one way or the other or deliver what's called the posterior arm in order to have room to get your hand in, you do an episiotomy. And sometimes that in and of itself gives enough room for baby to deliver. So it's all about space um, yeah. when we do that. Okay. Um, thankfully, both of those things are also very rare. So I can tell you, I've probably done one episiotomy in the past seven years that I've been practicing on my own. So, yeah. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so not as common as people may think no. that it happens. And and when I counsel patients, you know, they bring, you bring in your birth plan and you go through things about whether you want an epidural and about episiotomy, about delayed cord clamping. Again, it goes back to those two things, how baby's tolerating labor and whether your cervix is dilated. And it's always a discussion We're happy. You don't have to have an epidural. If you don't want an epidural, I'm not going to do any episiotomy unless it's one of those two situations and I will talk to you about it. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 we don't do these things. There are indications for yeah. why we do them. So a little off topic, but on topic, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about birth plans? Birth plans, I think are great in the sense that you are thinking about the process, you're doing research to find out what we do. So it's great to know that we, you know, you don't have to have an epidural. Sometimes some places offer nice nitrous oxide. Do they limit you in labor? Do you want to be mobile in labor? Um, uh, you know, like, do you want baby to be washed? Do you want baby to get the vitamin K? So it gets you, um, gives you the knowledge and gets you a little bit prepared. Um, some of them are things that we don't generally think about, you know, so I don't mind birth plans. It has to, you know, it's a discussion, sure. you know, whether dad's going to deliver baby or not really depends on the situation. So yeah, yeah. that's in a lot of them, but um, <laughs> so I think, I think they're great because they get people prepared. How do you have the conversation with patients about flexibility with birth plans? Um, Cause I, I know from personal experience and also talking to other moms and being part of these mom forums that when something, when the plan doesn't happen exactly as it's been laid out in someone's mind, that can cause its own set of distress and mm -hmm. anxiety, dissatisfaction with the process, the whole thing. But 
that's a plan that we've we've created kind of in a vacuum, not really understanding what might happen. So how do you how do you get patients to think about being more flexible with that whole mm -hmm. plan? Yep. And that's why we're here. And that's why we're doing this. Yeah. So, uh, that all, it all makes sense. Yeah. So it, it's true. And, and having an idea of what you want is great. Being rigid about it, it just doesn't work in labor. And that's because, you know, if you have a kid already, you know, they don't always behave. They don't always listen. To you. <laughs> you don't always do what you want. That all that starts in utero. Um, so what I tell people is it's great to have an idea, but to be rigid about it and, and you know, it, it, it doesn't help and it doesn't really work because situations arise where yeah. we have to do certain interventions. We do, I mean, C-sections are necessary um, under certain circumstances. Nobody wants to do a C-section, least of all us, you know, so our plan isn't going in and say, everybody's going to have a C-section. There are reasons why we do it. And baby's lives, mom's lives are saved because of it. You know, there isn't any necessary research to back that it, this up, but I would say the labors that go the smoothest and the kind of most according to plan are the ones that you go with the flow. And so it's an anecdotally, but it's true. And I've seen thousands of births. It's like, if you go with the flow and we have a discussion about what's going on, things generally happen in your favor. Yeah. The more you resist and, and things like an epidural, your body is tense. You know, your hold, your muscles are contracted. The more you hold it all in because you're trying to save your, you know, be a hero in one sense, you know, epidurals are there for a reason and relaxing your body or allowing your body to relax with one really lets the cervix, you know, the contractions do what they need to do. So it is, it's a conversation. And if there are things you really, really want, we will do our best to make them happen. But like you said, it's babies don't behave, bodies don't behave, you know, the way. And, and again, it goes back to, we have no idea. One, you don't know what you're really getting into and what it, what's going to happen. And who we don't know what's going to happen. And that goes into kind of the second part of this too, yeah. is that um, we don't talk to patients about every single thing that can happen. Obviously, it's a long conversation, um, but if you don't need something, we're not going to talk to you about it until it's time. So things like how we monitor the baby. So when you come in, you know, we monitor the baby externally. So you've got these two little kind of tablets on your belly. One is for um, to monitor the baby's heart rate. The other is a tocometer that measures the, um, the frequency of contractions. It, externally, the one on your belly doesn't measure, measure the strength of the contractions. If we need more um, close monitoring or are having a hard time picking up the contractions or the baby's heart rate, there are things like internal monitors that we can put a FSC, a fetal scalp electrode directly on the baby's head. Or if we need to measure the strength of the contractions, like I was saying before, to titrate the Pitocin or to help um, do an amnio infusion, which is putting saline uh, back into the uterus to try to help to resolve variable decelerations. Yeah. We put in an IUPC, an intrauterine pressure catheter, which actually measures millimeters of mercury. So it measures the strength of the contraction. So we know how much Pitocin to give you. We can also time exactly the um, deceler, if you're having those late decelerations I was talking about, we can time those exactly to the contractions. So you might have lots of cords coming out from below, which a lot of people don't expect, um, you know, and if you have an epidural, you have a Foley catheter in the bladder as well. And so not everybody needs those. So we don't tell you about them until you actually need them. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's part of the understanding of all this as well is we could, you know, there are so many things that can happen in labor. We don't go through every different scenario yeah. until you need it. Yeah. I mean, shoot, I sat through, obviously my OB training is not nearly as extensive as yours. I had one you know, course in, in medical school, but you, there's a lot of information, right? Like, um, and I guess when I was going through the process, I just knew a dangerous amount. I knew enough to be dangerous. <laughs> right. Right. And that's not uh, do anything. So 
Yeah, and you can find out so much information uh, on labor and delivery, or sorry, I, I mean, there's a lot that can happen in labor and delivery, but, you know, by Googling or asking your friends, and there's importance in that, but everybody's body is de different and everybody's situation is different. And so you can have an idea of it, but it doesn't mean that's going to necessarily be your experience. Yeah. So I guess we can go ahead and skip into, skip into, um, C-sections, um, the big, the big scary, right? Like everyone knows they exist. There are really specific indications for cesarean sections, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you kind of talk us through what those indications are and how you as the physician are making that decision as you're seeing, you know, labor progress. Sure. There are, you know, there's, I'm going to back up just a second sure. in that, in that C-sections aren't the only, you know, um, uh, operative vaginal delivery or operative deliveries that we talk about. So there's obviously the normal spontaneous vaginal delivery, which is you have pushed the baby out on your yeah. own. Then there are vacuum assisted vaginal deliveries where we put a little suction vacuum cup on the back of the top of the baby's head. And we don't really pull, you push, but we kind of help assist and keep the baby's head down. Um, and then there's forceps assisted vaginal delivery, which are forceps around the baby and whether baby's head, whether we do vacuum or forceps mostly depends on where you trained. And that's kind of um, where in the country you train. So I don't do forceps. I do vacuum. They both do very, the same thing with slightly different um, indications and risks. And then there's obviously the C-section. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the um, vacuum and forceps, that's generally if you're really close to having the baby, uh, you're fully dilated, you're pushing and baby's heart rate goes down is a big indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, or the biggest indication for that is you need to get baby out a little bit quicker um, and it can happen vaginally. Um, the other reason for it is depending on how long you've been pushing. So we generally give you up to three to four hours, depending whether it's first baby or not, or whether um, you have an epidural or not to deliver the baby vaginally. And it's the hardest ab workout you will ever do in your life. You are pushing down using your abs for hours and that's every, every two to three minutes for hours. And so it's exhausting. And sometimes mom just is too exhausted and just needs a little bit of assistance. So those are the two overarching reasons for doing one or the other. There are some other major medical reasons where you know, for cardiac reasons, mom can't bear down or Valsalva. So um, we don't need to go into that. Um, and then there's the C-section. Um, the emergent kind of scary C-section where you're rushing back with little conversation, you're like, we got to do this, is all because of baby's heart rate. You know, baby's heart rate goes down, stays down, and does not come back up. That's the biggest reason for that rush, that scary, that overarching, but, um, you know, the fear that doesn't happen the majority of the time so indication my kids <laughs> yeah your kids are just you know <laughs> they're, they're dramatic they love the they're drama dramatic. yeah like, i want out and i want it now no. <laughs> um so you know those recurrent decelerations that i was talking about and if you're not getting any closer or, you know labor's going too slow and baby's showing distress and that is you want baby out within 30 minutes once you decide so you talk about it anesthesia comes in talks to you we roll you back and you know it it um you know it happens quickly but not emergently so we have three things it's you know emergent you got to go urgent is usually within 30 minutes and then you know we got to do this but doesn't you know it can it can wait a little bit of time um it's interesting because c-sections are the only one of the only procedures where you're awake for them so it's weird it's weird you know you've got to drape up you can't see what's happening below you're on your back and kind of in you know a cross position arms are strapped down and you're with the anesthesiologist and you can hear the surgeons talking mm -hmm. and it's a it's a weird experience um and the epidural doesn't take all sensation away either. So just know that is it takes pain, sharp pain away, but you do feel pressure and you do, do feel touch. So we're moving around in there 
and it feels weird. And then we have to act concerning from the patient side, because you don't understand necessarily that why am I, I, okay, I can feel you touching me and I know you're about to cut me. And that seems like a bad thing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, but I don't feel it. I can, or it's not painful. So you feel it, it's not painful. So I always counsel patients beforehand and usually anesthesia does too. And I kind of put my hands on your belly and show that movement. It was like, you're going to feel this. You're going to feel movement and touch and pressure. You should not feel any sharp pain or pain in general. And if you do, you got to let us and the anesthesiologist know. The other thing is we then have to act as the contraction. So there's one point when we get the baby out that we are pushing down just below your sternum, you know, but at the top of your uterus and we're pushing down. And so you feel like a weight is on your chest because that's how you get the baby out. (laughs) So it is, you know, and you as parents want to be able to see your baby right away. We know that and we try to help you as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we can drop the drapes and like lift baby up and show you afterwards. We do always hand the the baby to the pediatrician to check the baby out. But oftentimes if babies is okay, they can bring him, her, they to your head and you can have baby for the rest of the time while we finish putting it back together. Yeah. So on your shut. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, we've got really cute pictures of both my boys right next to, to my face with big blue drape in the background. <laughs> yeah, and they've got the vernix all over them. They can't open their eyes. And, no, they're cute. They're so cute. It's true. And so, so indication. So, biggest one, you know, heart rate issues in yeah. babies not tolerating labor very well, um, or doesn't like the contractions. Um, other reasons are not dilating, you know, you're kind of stuck and we say arrest of dilation or stage one arrest where your cervix just doesn't want to open anymore. Um, and that's where before we go to a C-section, we go, don't go directly to a C-section, but we give you time. We give you the Pitocin. Those things can all help, but they don't always work. And that's where, um, you know, we talk about a C-section. Uh, time in labor matters as well. There are some inductions that take three to four days. Hopefully not. That's not a fun experience, but you know, baby does better when things happen a little bit faster. Sure. Yeah. Other indications for C-section where the placenta is, the placenta is over the cervix. You can't have a vaginal delivery. If you've had a prior C-section before, you can talk about it, but that's a reason for you to choose if you want a, another C-section. Um, And then there are lots of other medical reasons, but those are the main ones for why coming in and thinking that you're going to have a vaginal delivery um, and not having one are, yeah, heart rate changes, you don't, your cervix doesn't change and a a placental abruption, which is scary, but it's not always a reason for a C-section, but it's where the placenta can start to shear off the uterine wall and cause some bleeding. Um, If you're progressing and close to delivering and baby's heart rate's okay, it's fine to have a vaginal delivery. If you're not close to delivering or it's a lot of bleeding and baby's heart rate doesn't, you know, isn't doing well, then we're going to be talking about a C-section. So I think it's, it's really good, you know, having these conversations and letting women know that first and foremost, baby safety and mom safety are forefront in your mind when you're making these decisions. I think a lot of times women feel rushed um, mm-hmm. and they're not quite sure why things are being rushed. And I've, I've seen the, you know, mis, misunderstanding or, you know, assumption that, you know, maybe doctor has a golf game later that he, you know, doesn't want to hang around anymore for, and, you know, just wants to be done with your delivery. And I, that's not how it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that has happened in the past. I'm also sure that 99.9999% of the time, that is not the case. Um, yeah. The physician has your your and your baby's best interest in mind when they're making these, these medical decisions because nobody takes surgery lightly. It's true. Right. You know, that's why we, you know, we, we, uh, you know, like I said, and and you can't do a surgery willy nilly, there has to be an indication and a reason for it. Um, And so, and and that's all documented, you know, so we have to have it and it's reviewed, depending on where you are, it's reviewed. So um, it's true when we say, you know, healthy baby, healthy mom, we really mean it, but it can be said without the understanding too, that 
it really, this is a practice we put in place and why we have all, we, you know, we monitor baby's heart rate and that is what tells us healthy baby. You know, these, these, or mom with bleeding or we want you to have that vaginal delivery just as much as you want it. And it is an open discussion. Um, and it's true, sometimes we have to move fast. What I would say too, is we all want that perfect experience or the experience that we want in labor. And that can happen as long as those other things, the med medical things are kind of in place, which is baby's okay, mom's okay, and it's going all right. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I know it's a Saturday morning. You've taken some uh, much needed r, &R time <laughs> to, to talk to us. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to call you and chat for personal reasons later. So we'll. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you for having me on.